Hello, stupid. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Good. Um, excited to be recording today. Right. I know. Me too. I'm. Um, I'm very excited for for this episode today. Oh my God! Happy New Year's. Happy New Year. Oh my God. Yes, we're in 2024. Can you believe it? Wild. I can't. I can't. I still have a hard time believing we passed 2020. New Year, you'll be back there. Yes. Do you have resolutions? Uh, you know what? I kind of do actually. It's not like a resolution resolution, but I would really tr- like like to run like a uh, 10K this year. Wild. Yeah. Wow. You know what? I would like to run a race or not a race, but I would run like to run do in a, a public setting. Like, no, not a marathon for sure. Um, okay. Either either a five or a 10. Okay. But just like I'd like to commit to that. Like I can, I know I can do a 5K, but I'd like to be able to train for a 10K. But we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna harass you with that. Every uh, like five episodes I'm gonna be how's your running? How's your running, Sonia? <laughs> um, how about you? Do you have one? Um I don't intend on running. <laughs> but I think uh I have a few, but I think mostly Time management. I want to get my time management in order this year. Figure that out. Fair. It's always been a mess. And I feel like it's just a matter of a little bit of organization and I can get it figured out. Fair. Um, I feel like... I feel like, yeah, like New Year's resolutions are so like overplayed. Like I feel like they're expected to be a big thing. Like, yeah, run a marathon this year. <laughs> but just be on top of things is a great New Year's yeah. resolution. It also sounds like you Googled New Year resolutions and like you took the first like result. <laughs> Surprisingly, I did it. I know, yeah. like I think for me, like I, I think I've told you this before, like before I turn 30, I want to be in the best shape of my life. If You're I can. about being 29. <laughs> 28 still, but yes, in a couple of months, I will be 29. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's such a cliche too, as I'm speaking about it. I'm like, I feel like everyone before turning 30 has this kind of dream. I did, I did feel that pressure a lot also when, uh, when I was getting closer to 30. Yeah. And you know what? I'm 33, soon 34, and I've never been more comfortable in my body. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? Then and like last crazy. year. So Yeah. Good for you. And you know what? I me too. I feel like I was really happy with my body last this yeah, in twenty twenty three. Um and I wanna yeah, I wanna maintain that confidence. How's a good good New Year's resolution? I wanna be Wait, confident. Yes, okay, I like that. And I like that you detach it from a specific physical goal. True. I think just feeling confident is the is the key. Exactly. Yeah. Whatever whatever gets you there. Yeah. No numbers attached to it. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want a confident run. <laughs> I'm kidding. I honestly don't care that much about running. Uh, <laughs> I feel like you're totally right. It was like just like you asked me what I want to do, and I was like, uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. You said it. I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> but I, now I feel like you have started us off with an icebreaker. Did yeah, you kind know of. my role? I know. Um, New was Year's that your role? It was not, no. Okay. Do you but still I'm still want to gonna do ask me. Yeah, it, I feel do like it. you're gonna like this one. Okay. If you were an ice cream flavor, what ice cream flavor would you be? <laughs> I mean, Rocky and Road. Why? <laughs> Rocky Road for obvious reasons. <laughs> I mean, no. Joke aside, um, you know what? Probably vanilla. For also obvious reasons, <laughs> you're not vanilla. <laughs> well, you're, 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 yeah, you can be vanilla if you want to be vanilla. But you know what? I'm like a uh, French vanilla with the like speckles of like of of uh, black in it. That tastes like very fancy. Yeah. 
So like um, I'm like I'm vanilla, but like I've mastered the art of being vanilla. Okay, have you ever had t- Tahitian vanilla? Tahitian. Ooh, that sounds good. I did actually have that already. We just bought that for the first time. We usually buy French vanilla to eat like with pie or something. Yeah, yeah. And I liked it. I feel like it would be cultural appropriation if I claim to be tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why you serve French vanilla. I get no, it. it wasn't. It was the only French vanilla I could think of. But <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Good answer. Yeah. What about you? Um, I'd be like a little sorbet. I think. As in, I'm not. What do you mean, be ice cream? I'm that unique. <laughs> <laughs> You're breaking your own rules. That's so annoying. <gasps> a mango sorbet. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound delicious. Now I'm yeah. And that's how we're going to start off the new year after setting all these goals. Let's talk about ice cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why mango? Oh, I don't know, actually. Good question. I like mango. Sweet, but a bit sour. That's exactly it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I should have said coconut. Brown and hairy on the outside and white on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> Sanya. That's what they Brown call the whitewashed. Yeah. That's what they call the whitewashed um, Indian person a coconut. Oh my god, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> oh my god. Um, do you spend New Year's with your family usually? Um, no. Usually, I work it. I feel like there's just so much pressure around going around New Year's that I can't deal with that so um, I, it's just it yeah it's just a lot of yeah i'd rather just work um i feel better that way um and then yeah me and my husband sometimes when we the next day we're together we pretend like we had new year's that like you know that eve and uh 12 o'clock wherever it is and then we'll cheers to that that's so random that's yeah so random. how about you um like New Year's is kind of the only holiday I like actively care about. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why. I think like I just like picked one at random and like I have to care about something. So let it be a New Year's kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, do, I do really like New Year's. Like I like the times I have gone out. But then sometimes it's like, you know, like you you never want to drink and drive. So it's like, okay, like who's sober or how much are we paying for Ubers and mm-hmm. what is your pricing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd rather kind of stay in. Well, typically when I go on a New Year's, by the time I'm done, the metro started running again. <laughs> <laughs> the sun is rising. <laughs> kind of. But because they keep the clubs open all night on New Year's. Oh, yeah, um, true. And I like to go dancing. I like to start off with a bang. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> um, well, for the New Year's and after... The holiday period. I have a subject that's a little bit different. This, uh, well, I don't know if it's different. We've only done like six episodes. I don't know. There's a trend yet already. <laughs> but um, maybe my approach is a bit different. I wanted to honor um, the people who are really important to me in my life that maybe I don't get to see so much of the holidays because of the family obligations Mm -hmm. and so i wanted to do an episode on um chosen families oh that's so cute i'm excited yeah so um well maybe what do you know about the concept of chosen families or what does that mean to you i'm not i'm not quizzing you this time i swear (laughs) trying to make me sound (laughs) stupid again uh honestly i would say chosen family is your friends that have become family that's how i would look at it yeah 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 Okay, uh, like, w- w- do you have many friends that you you want to build our family? Uh, do I do I have many friends? Period. Um, no, I do. Yeah, I think especially uh, because uh, I've moved out. Like, I live in a different province than where my parents do. I live about a five hour flight away from my mm-hmm. parents. I have learned to make my friends that do live around me. They become they feel like family now, you know, yeah. and. Um, and not just that. I think um, because I – or I don't I don't know why I feel like I need to justify it because I think I feel like I come from a small family. I, I remember growing up and wishing I had more cousins or being closer to my cousins, which I mm. wasn't. And now I feel like I have so many friends that feel like cousins, you know, that right. have 
and feel like family, even though we're not blood related. That's fair. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Um, okay, so let me go a little bit into some definition, mm -hmm. and then we can talk about it some more. Um, so first of all, the, the term itself, uh, chosen family, kind of came up in the 1980s with a book called Families We Choose that was by Keith Weston. Okay. Um, but it's by no means a new concept. Like it was already like a very old concept at the time. Mm -hmm. But in that book, she looked a lot at gay communities um, in the context of the AIDS crisis that was going on full force at that time. Right. And it was, uh, uh, it was focused on San Francisco in particular. Okay. Um, and the concept of chosen families emerged a lot um, in that context and became very uh, important in that context. Because, um, well, I think queer and, 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 and gay people are often um, uh, are more subject to being rejected by their own family. Um, even more so back then, yeah. right? And there was such, such, such stigma about the AIDS crisis. It's funny because without even knowing what I was going to be researching, I actually saw a play um, last week about that exactly. It's called uh, Ne suis jamais de larmes sanguins, which means never wipe away tears without gloves. Aww. And it was about like uh, the... Um, you know, the, the AIDS crisis in Stockholm, actually. But um, what, what, what happened is that um, these people were deeply stigmatized. It was called like the gay cancer, right? And were extremely sick and basically had a, a death sentence and were rejected by their family and needed people to offer them end-of-life care, right? And mm -hmm. so those friends would come play those roles that are, very, very traditionally played by family. Okay. And I think even though a lot of them didn't have legal rights to take decisions, stuff like that, I think there was some understanding in the hospitals that we'll look the other way and we'll bend some rules a little bit because no one else is there or showing up to make those decisions. Right? Yeah. Um, so chosen family is uh, made up of people who have intentionally chosen to nurture love support and care for each other mm -hmm. um, and it's an ever-growing and changing concept to to become like more inclusive because the purpose of the expression itself is to do contrast to a biological family and so mm -hmm. anything that you could define outside of biological family basically could be chosen family yeah right um, but like I said, it's been around for, for a long time. Um, for example, like in many African communities, there's a long history of uh, children finding new parents after their own parents were either killed or enslaved. Yeah. Um, so it's like, it's not a new concept. It's a, it, it's a thing. People adopting other kids in the community um, mm -hmm. to offer hair and like offer care and, and love and support. Right. Yeah. Um, there's also communities that just very much live like that still, right? Just communities in which uh, the responsibility of raising the children falls onto the entire tribe and not just on the biological parents of those children. Yeah. Takes a and village. Then, yeah, exactly. Right. And then there's also uh, communities where uh, traditionally caring for the elders is the responsibility of the entire community. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the way people build or describe their chosen family is very different from one to another, basically, right? But uh, you'll have some more traditional that have a mother or father role. And one that comes to mind very obviously in that sense is, um, are you familiar with the, the ballroom scene, the ball scene? A little bit? I don't the think voguing, so. The voguing scene. Oh, oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. So have you seen uh, either Pose or Paris is, Bill, uh, is Burning? No, and I kind of want to. I I know like they refer to it um a lot on like Drag Race and stuff. RuPaul, yeah. RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, I've yeah. heard a lot about it, but no, I haven't watched it. Um, yeah, we should watch that comparison burning one time together. I think you'd be into it. Pose also was amazing show. It was really really good. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically, um, 
it's a uh, structure that has, you know, they, they, they call themselves like houses. And you have the head of a house, which is typically the mother um, who looks after the other members of the house. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's caring in a very, very traditional family way. Often they will live together. Um, they will, they will, you know, push each other to, to work on that and work on this for their future and stuff like that and really support each other. And even like mix finances at some point, like sometimes and, 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 and help each other with, with um, with figuring that out. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it's not only in those sense that you have, you know, in, in, in that scene that you have um, parental figures, I think uh, even uh, myself, I have, a very close friend who quickly became a parental figure for me, who is an mm-hmm. older friend and who became, uh, not that he has to be older to become that, but who became a, <laughs> just yeah. to it up. <laughs> like well, a, a, like a fatherly figure for at me. At least. Um, yeah. I, I haven't heard of many scenarios where your parental figure become, is someone younger than you, you know? Yeah. 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 But it's, um, yeah, it's 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 a, a role that he plays a bit in my life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, but some don't look at all like the nuclear family. Some chosen family you don't look at all like that. They more might, might look more like close friends, mm-hmm. which I think is what people are most familiar with. Um, some are co living situations, for example, like roommates or or a, a, a community building, mm-hmm. uh, or co owning like townhouses. Um, mm-hmm. Some are more co-parenting situations also. Like, like it takes a village and people take that very literally, right? And mm-hmm. like co-parent their children. Um, and then some are also more romantic, like um, uh, polycules for polyamorous uh, relationships. Oh, which I haven't will heard have... of the term polycules. Yeah, it's basically uh, your um, network of relationships. And okay. they will often... Not always, but they will often live together um, and act as a family. Even though not everyone is necessarily in a relationship with everyone, mm-hmm. they'll be part of the the family unit, the polycule. Okay, that's cute. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and many research indicates that the the absence of the support of the family of origin of your, your biological family, um, having a chosen family builds resilience Mm -hmm. so it's a very useful tool for a lot of people right yeah it will in fact often emerge from a need that that isn't being fulfilled um by your biological family and that's not to say that it's always because you've been rejected or you have a terrible biological family sometimes it is sometimes it's because you don't have that support and you need to to um to find it Mm -hmm. but sometimes they exist in parallel you have that support from your biological family in some sense but you need some additional supports in another sense totally there's Um, some things that you might not want to talk to your maternal mother about but another female figure in your life would or you know like it depends like like i know there's things i call my mom for and there's things i'd call a different friend for you know and I think especially when there's uh, cultural differences, whether they're generational differences or um, just, for example, for me, you know, I think I can't really turn for to my family to help me navigate gay culture, mm-hmm. right? And it's very present in my life and it's something that's complex and difficult to navigate and difficult to understand, right? Mm-hmm. But um, I can't really count on the support of my family there because they'll be even more lost than I am. Yeah. Right? Um, or uh, generationally also, well, if you, you know, would your mom be the best person place to help you deal with um, the pressure you're getting on social media from mm-hmm. all these other influencers and how that makes you feel about your body? Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Maybe you'll turn to a friend who's more familiar with that. Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't 
directed at you, by the way. I was just trying to find that. <laughs> all of those marathon <laughs> accounts. <Yeah. laughs> right. Um, also, sometimes they mix your biological family and your chosen family. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of a example of that, that just was like, oh yeah, of course, everyone has that. Um, but I didn't think of at first was family friend. Mm-hmm. You know, we all have an uncle or an aunt that's not really an uncle or not really an aunt. Yeah. That's part of our parents' chosen family. Totally. But that was integrated to our, to their biological family. Yeah. I think in Indian cultures, especially we, um, call everyone uncle and auntie and like, mm. like, and I remember I never questioned it. Everyone was an uncle, everyone older than me. That is approximately my parents age was an uncle or auntie. Um, and then like later in life, I started questioning like, Oh, are we actually related to this person to my mom? And she's like, Oh no. And right. then, you know, like, yeah, exactly. That is your chosen family or my, right. your parents chosen family in a way. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it's interesting how your parents chosen family becomes part of your family which isn't a conscious choice on your part but it's not biological either but feels more biological to you because it's part of their chosen family mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um and yeah like i said it doesn't necessarily negate or take away from your biological family mm-hmm. um, you know sometimes they just can't offer that assistance in a case that you and i live for example just because of distance exactly right um um, and I think that brings through for a lot of immigrants also, right? They have to build a community of, of support that they can't get from their family just because there's a great distance between them, mm-hmm. right? Or again, like, yeah, I can't relate to like specific subcultures or, or, or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, do, yeah, okay, perfect. I'll get into it in a little moment. I just wanted to underline, however, that it's, very pretty monthly part right like very in- intersect with the queer culture mm-hmm. like it's it's a very strong part of queer culture and often very attached to it it's it's very important to queer communities i think partly because of that subculture that's difficult to navigate yeah and also obviously because of the rejection that um often comes with identifying as lgbtqa plus mm-hmm. um so, although it's not exclusive to it, I wanted to to still um, recognize that it's a very important part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you'll have friends taking on role of caretaker, for example, during the AIDS crisis, as we as we we explained. Yeah. Um, but friends offering support for being rejected in your family, for example, like uh, people who are directly put on the street, or offer. Um, roof over their head by friends right Mm -hmm. and then start co-living with these these parents or sometimes teenagers who are being kicked out of the house will join uh will be like adopted into the house of friends with their parents and their parents will start taking care of them yeah as if they were right that's something that's that that rings true often also Mm -hmm. um then the ball culture as was discussed earlier is born out of support for queer trans people of color who were being rejected by white gays. At that time, it was a community that was very, very much a safe space within the gay community from the gay community. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, And then you'll have um, often for trans people, friends are very, or chosen family is really important to help you navigate the the healthcare system Mm -hmm. because they face a lot of um, trials trying to navigate that. Uh, yeah. a lot of uh stigma. misunderstanding stigma rejection and um it's easier to have someone who went through it to navigate you through it mm-hmm. and also you know hormone therapy is violent on your body you know someone mm-hmm. who understands it and can help help you manage it as well right yeah someone who's been through it a lot of times yeah like the common yeah. denominator kind of yeah so that's true for for trans people but i think it's also very true for just neurodivergent people in general. I mm-hmm. think there's a lot of stigmatization around mental health. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very difficult to ma- navigate getting help, uh, medical help for your mental health. And and that's something that can be 
uh, very crucial to have someone to support you and care for you and help you and guide you through it, right? Yeah. Me- almost like mentor you through it, right? Mm-hmm. And then another one that's very true for, for trans people, um, ensuring that your deaf wishes are respected as well. Mm. Right? And that's someone who's going to advocate for you and fight for you beyond death. For example, if your biological family um, want to bury you in uh, the wrong and close assigned to the wrong gender. Oh, yeah. I didn't think of that. Which is something that often happens, right? Mm-hmm. Um, especially that, you know, trans people are subject to a lot of, uh, of violence um, and unfortunately often um, are at higher risk of dying young. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if they're, you know, being rejected by their family and forced into space that aren't, aren't safe. And yeah. then after all that being buried in the wrong gender that you've been trying your whole life to separate yourself from, yeah, you know, it's just, it, it must be so scary to live with that. Right. And so to have people who are like are in your corner and will advocate strongly for you, exactly, even though there might not always be their legal rights for it, at least morally they can advocate for you, you know? Yeah, exactly. So I think that's why it's still so very important today, the queer community, that mm-hmm. that that system's in place. But like I said, it's also very true for many, many other communities. Uh, we've men- mentioned neurodivergent communities, um, you know, not just for navigating uh, the healthcare system, but just navigating every day life. Mm-hmm. You know, it's helpful to have people who understand you. And I think it's often uh, the case that... Um, you'll look to surround yourself and to, to build those family ties with people uh, like you. Um, immigrants also. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of in the context you and I met, right? Um, we're not immigrants. Well, so I, at first I was going to use the term expats, but I was like, hmm, let me look it up first. Do you know what expat mm-hmm. stands for? No, not really, actually. I've heard that term a million times. Yeah, it's expatriates. So it means that live and work outside of your country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been used often, like, because Canada is such a big country, we'll use it often for, you know, living on the other coast or whatever, Mm -hmm. which was where I was getting at. But then I was looking into it. I was like, wait, why, why that term and not immigrant? And turns out expat is used only for white people. So they can oh. differenti- differ- differentiate themselves from immigrants because they're not comfortable with the term immigrant when they go live in another country. Oh, this is actually better than that. So expat is not a good term. Interesting, because yeah. I know, like when I, um, when my my family and I lived in Dubai, um, I did hear the term migrant workers and expats used in different ways. So yeah. So now it makes sense. Yeah. So expat would be like the white European communities or the American communities. Yeah. Whereas wow. everyone else would be labeled as immigrants. That's okay. Isn't that my, I was like, God damn it. We're like, it never stops. We're <laughs> so <laughs> twisted. <laughs> That's insane. I didn't know that. And you know what? I look forward to telling people because I feel like that term is used very loosely. It is. You it know? Is. Right, and I think so, a lot of the ter- times, the time the, when it when it is used, people don't really understand the real meaning of it because then they I don't think a lot of people would be using it. No, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a big country like Canada, um, although you know you wouldn't say that I immigrated to Vancouver, um, it still still felt that way because culture is completely different. The setting is completely different. Um, and the language, in my case, was different also, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but, and, and just the distance is so great also. Mm-hmm. Right? So when we met out there for for, uh, for work, we were, were both from the, the West Coast. Um, East Coast. I don't know for you, sorry, East Coast. Yeah, we're both from the East Coast. I don't know for you, because we didn't meet until later. Um, as, like we've been established in Vancouver for a while. But for me, I'd very much quickly built a little uh, community uh, with a friends 
that felt very much uh, more familial and mm -hmm. more of a chosen family mm -hmm. to help me navigate this new city. Mm -hmm. I think it was a little hard for me to even like have a support group out in Vancouver for a while. Um, we, I actually went back and forth a lot uh, from Toronto to Vancouver. So I actually, you know, spent a lot of my time in Toronto. So I didn't even work on making that uh, support mm. group. And then um, my boyfriend at the time, now husband, moved um, to Vancouver three months after I did from Toronto as well. So yeah. it was, I had him. So right. I guess I didn't branch out that much. And there's a lot said about the West Coast culture is they're not as welcoming. Um, yeah. So because I didn't branch out and because the culture wasn't as welcoming, I, it took me a really long time to get um, group, you know, a little community of my own. I actually even uh, made a Bumble account. Um, I don't know if it still exists, but there's Bumble, Bumble BFF. BFF. Yeah, exactly. No way. Because I also felt like a girl in a relationship because I can't like, I'm not dating, right? I'm not dating yeah. guys and like going yeah. partying with um, any girls at that time because I had no girlfriends. Uh, mm -hmm. So I found it really hard. So I made Bumble BFF. I went on some dates with some girls. Wow. Um, it, and it's so funny because the girls, the only girls I did connect with were all not from there. You know, everyone oh. else was from different places in um, Canada, um, not from BC itself. Yeah. Um, but I want to say now after eight years of living in Vancouver, I have a great group of friends. Um, yeah. And I think like it took me at least two years, you know, to feel like, okay, I have my people here. You know, I have some people here. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I think it is really important. It makes a difference in two you know, can you stay or not, basically. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right? Um, and you know what? It's so funny because I um, just went to a friend's. She does like a little like friend Christmas party. Mm -hmm. And this is my second year going. And it just felt so nice to have. And she's uh, born and raised there. Or no, so, sorry, she isn't. But she's been living there all, like, I want to say a good chunk of her life. Right. And it just felt so nice to have someone open up their home to me. Um, yeah. because that is something like, cause majority of my friends are not from there as well. Um, it feels so nice to have someone that like lives here and they're like, Oh, I want friends from outside of here. Um, yeah. Cause unfortunately, yeah. Like I said before, Vancouver. And there's something about off. like a home cooked meal. Mm -hmm. That's just, especially when you live away from home, that's just like so heartwarming and so, um, healing. A hundred percent. My second yeah. year going was so nice. Unfortunately, my husband couldn't make it this year. And the next mm. morning she texts me and she's like, hey, we have leftovers. Bring Avril. And we both were like, okay, you don't have to ask Aww. us twice. And her Cute. parents live 10 minutes away. So it was really easy for us to go. So we literally ate at her house two days in a row, which was like, we have so many leftovers. It was so nice. Oh, that is really cute. Yeah. Um, other ways that it's manifested in other communities, um, sororities and frats. Frat, frat house mm -hmm. like those are um very much so chosen families to an extent mm -hmm. right? well first of all they call themselves brothers and sisters yeah but they care for each other at least uh from what i understood on the on their career paths in the future as well mm -hmm. look after each other in that sense and have a sense of responsibility towards members of your sororities mm -hmm. or members of your your, your frat yeah it wasn't really big when I went to school. I I feel like it's more of an American thing, at least in Ontario. Um, I think, yeah, it is definitely more of an American thing, but it is a thing here. Yeah. Um, Justin was just telling me about a good friend of his who was in a sorority and was very, very implicated. Um, and I want to say even president, but I don't know if they have presidents or, or leaders or I know they have like uh, they call them. <laughs> um, I I like I really like this term where they call it like my big, like you have like a mentor, so they're like your big. Oh, big sister. Yeah, um, this girl I follow on Instagram, like, like she'll be like, oh, you know, spending the day with my big, and I'm like, that's so cute, big and little. Oh my uh, God. that's so funny. Um, but um, he, I was asking him like, oh, do you know like now that's been many many years since graduation. Are they still in touch? Like, are they still close? He's like, oh yeah, it was all of her bridesmaids. Wow! At her at her wedding last year. 
That's crazy. Right. So、yeah. it is very much of those bonds also. Yeah. Oh, and kind of like Girl Scout and Boy Scout as well. Oh, interesting. I think、yeah. that's also when you start up when you're little. But I feel like I don't know if. Do you think I don't know much about I don't know anyone who's been in in Boy Scouts or in Girl Scouts. Do you think they stay in touch throughout their lives? I don't know about throughout their life. I think I I, I feel like some some do. Um, <laughs> and they put on the uniform every Sunday. Oh, you know, actually, you know, oh, that's so funny you brought that up. Yeah, I saw a TikTok recently, and it was this girl was like, I just walked into the washroom, and a girl was. Like throwing up over the toilet, and there's three other girls standing around her reciting like the Girl Scout. Anthem. Oh my god! <laughs> you think it was in America, but I was that's like,、oh. wild. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Imagine you walk in, and you're like, "Oh, I don't know this one." <laughs> walk that, back up. That's so funny. Um, roommates, for example, also、mm-hmm. often have that that bond lasting afterwards. But also while they're living together, you know, cook meals for each other. Help、uh, each other out、uh, with different challenges of life and、um, emotional support as well. You know, roommates、mm-hmm. can play that role.、Um, I think、um, you know any people who are in a very similar experience that might be unrelatable for others, like in the military, for example. You know, it's very、mm-hmm. much of a brotherhood. Yeah.、Um, then、like、we touch on groups. Support groups, also, yeah, like AAs, for example. Yeah, there's、definitely. sponsors and stuff. Yeah,、um, and then one that you're、uh, recently familiar with, wedding parties. Right? How did、yeah. you choose those people? Oh my god! You know, like the, yeah, like that's my family, like my real family. family and my chosen family. You know, my biological、yeah. family and my chosen family for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I found this、um, this interesting article that had like advices on how to build that community for yourself. And first, the question was like, how do you know if you already have one? So、um, they asked two questions basically: Who would you call when you get the worst news of your life? Yeah. Oh, that's sorry, Sanya. Who would you call when you get the worst news? Of oh, your life? oh, that was a question.、Um, You know, like oh my god, there's so many people. You know, I think it、yeah. would depend what the news is, but there's so many people that I go to. You know, I think like you're up there. There's my biological god, family. I was sweating there. I was like, is she even gonna name me? <laughs> Imagine I just started <laughs> listing off friends, and I was like, yeah, thinking、yeah. about place about it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think there's like my biological family, who I'm very、yeah. close with. You, my partner, you, and then there's like two other friends. Nice, you know, and yeah. And then, who do you think would call you when they get the worst news of their life? I think those same people. Same people. Yeah,、so、I think it would be safe to say that. Yeah,、know? I mean, it depends what the news is, but I feel like there's those people that it's like. Things happen, and you're like, I can't wait to share it with them. You know, ba- like、mm-hmm. bad things、uh, or good things, even. You know, you're like,、yeah. like this person is like needs to know. You know, like you have、yeah. to be like update whether it's a call or text.、Um, but yeah, there is like a handful of people. It's funny because、um, like now I think he's pretty used to it. But at first, like Justin, when we would get into like Arguments or whatever, and you know, like a day later or something, I was like, "Oh, I was talking to Sonia, did it and whatever." It's like, did you tell her about like our argument? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and like he didn't mind, but now I think he like he doesn't even ask. Like he's like,、oh, yeah, he's going to tell Sonia. <laughs> That's so funny.、Um, yeah, are you the kind of person when good things happen, you reach out to people immediately, or? You like wait? No, I do. Yeah, yeah. There's a few specific people that I I reach out to immediately when good things happen. Yeah.、Um, there's a few specific people that I really want to make proud. Yeah. I really want them to be proud of me because I feel、yeah. like they invested so much in me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. And there's a lot of people who. Just express so much delight into good things happening to me. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So those are people I want to share the good news to. And when you have good things happen, are you like a texter or you call them? Uh, depends who. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some people which I don't really have a call relationship with. Mm-hmm. And there's some other people that I'm like, you know, I'm very big into voice notes lately. Yeah. I used to hate them. Yeah. I used um, to hate them, but I'm really big into them. I think ever since moving away from most of the people I know, I I, I kind of got the purpose of it. I'm not surprised because we have a podcast, so we know we like to hear ourselves. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I saw like a meme or whatever. It's like listening to your friends, like 45 minute voice note, like it's a podcast on your way to yeah. work. <laughs> Yeah. yeah um and okay so i think it's safe to say that you you do have that 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 system in place um but if you didn't or if you wanted to grow that system like like how to to build a, a bigger family first they recommend to put yourself in position to meet people with similar interests value or desires mm-hmm. so examples that they give is like um a lesbian book club for example or you could have like uh diabetic cooking club right Cute. or like neurodivergent walking club yeah, also yeah. known as a pokemon go trainers club <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. that was my own little joke oh and you did that oh yeah. proud of you <laughs> <laughs> i hope it lands yeah. no shade to all uh, pokemon go trainers out there <laughs> um or you can do some volunteer work mm-hmm. um right and then once you've identified the people and joined that group and you have to show up and keep showing up, mm-hmm. just consistency, keep going, you become a regular face there. And eventually those relationships will emerge out of that, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, exactly. You'll find your people. Yeah. Um, which I thought were really good advice. Can't say that. That's any of my how Michael's relationships happened. Yeah, I was I was gonna say the same thing. I don't I have I've not I haven't joined many clubs um, mm. after like school, but I think for me it was saying yes to social settings. Um, I think ah. I'm such a homebody um, that I I had to force myself to put myself out there and go to these things that I got invited to, and sometimes you hate it. And you're like, I'm never doing this again. Why did I step outside my comfort zone? Uh, Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you meet your people, you know. Um, But I think, and I, and I, but I want to say also that, and then fifty fifty, the second fifty would be work. That's where I met a lot of my people. Yeah, you work too. I know. Me too. Uh, Actually, a lot of my close friends for work, I have. one of my closest friends who was a neighbor mm, and nice. we met that way. Um, yeah. Or, you know or, or has been introduced to me through other friends also. Yeah. Actually funny um, thing about our neighbors. So we've been living in our building for about three years now. Um, and I only became friend with one neighbor and this is during COVID um, height of COVID. And this lady a 75-year-old grandmother moved in next door. Oh, you told me about her. And yeah, she sure. was very needy at first, but it was also COVID times. I had nothing going on in my life, um, especially for homebodies. COVID was perfect. You just say no to everyone because <laughs> you have symptoms. Um, but it, And then I worked from home at that time too, so I kind of isolated myself. Right. Um, and this lady would be knocking on my door every hour of the day, you know? And sometimes I'd be like, um, surely, like I am working right now. But then Mm -hmm. um, she was so sweet. She started cooking for me and my husband. Um, And then we had so much fun. She would watch The Bachelor and I would, um, she'd invite me over. I never watched The Bachelor before then. But it was so fun to watch it with someone. You know, we did watch parties. She would get me so drunk. Um, And once my parents came to visit and she had my parents over for dinner. And she had recently lost her husband and she was dating. 
So I helped her navigate dating at 75 years old. And she'd been married for, I think, like almost 40 years. Oh, that's so cute. It was a really different but exciting relationship. Um, it, I really enjoyed my time with her. I think she taught me so many things and I taught her a lot of things. Um, yes, I would call her out on her um, old people remarks some days. Um, right, right, but right. she took it like a champ. Like that's not kosher to say. You can't say those things. Yeah, um, yeah. But does she have children of her own? She does. And um, she has a, a daughter and a son. Son does not talk to her anymore, unfortunately. Um, mm. And her daughter and her did have a lot of conflict. Um, but yeah, she kind of like adopted me. And I uh, my, lost my grandparents very young. So I never really had, um, other than my parents, like a grandparent relationship. So I would call her my grandma. Um, mm. Yeah, we had a really good our relationship and then she kind of moved in with her new man and her and her new man like bought an rv and traveled all of north america cute yeah we're unfortunately not in touch anymore but it was a really cool experience the whole i think two years we were friends oh uh, that is really cute i like that yeah yeah um that's um you know that's that's something i wanted to touch in on eventually also it's that they, they're also, as opposed to a biological family, they're evolving and ever changing kind of chosen families, right? Mm -hmm. Which can be the beauty of it, but maybe sometimes can make it harder to commit to the people that you chose. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a like double edged sword. Like, you know, you, you don't have to put up with people's bullshit so much. Mm hmm. But also, um, you won't be able to build those strong connections if you don't show mm -hmm. that kind of commitment, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, of course they evolve um, either by you know the need kind of disappearing. Um, for example, um, you know, you move back home, right? Or, yeah. Um, you had a support group while you were going through cancer and you did complete remission, mm -hmm. right? So either through, through that or just through, you know, people changing over time and you fall out of, uh, sync, you know? Mm -hmm. I know for her, like when she started dating, it was hard for her to talk to her daughter about that. Right. I think that's why they did have conflict because her daughter was like, how mm. have you moved on from dad? You know, mm. but for me as a stranger that had no attachment to her husband or uh, her ex or her late husband, it was easy for her to talk to me about these things, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, exactly. Like you, she thought of me as a daughter, but I not being her daughter, not having attachment or known in her, um, her before she could talk to me about all these different things. You know? And I think it's, it's also kind of beautiful that you guys fulfilled a specific role in nature's life for, for a time being. And once you got what you both needed out of that, um, you moved on, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. I, I think that's completely fine. And, and that's kind of beautiful in its own. Exactly. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm like, oh, I wish we could stay in touch, but it's like, we don't, we didn't have much to talk about in the first place. We made things to talk about, but it was also mm -hmm. almost like French about a convenience you know, just yeah. during COVID, we needed someone. We lived right next door to each other. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so I think clearly we both understand the the the, the importance and the, the the meaningfulness that the chosen family can have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's something that slowly the legal system is catching on to as well. So I found this, and I was happily surprised to find this: the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Um, published a paper on on basically uh, navigating um, caregiving and and work, mm -hmm. and at first the design this is how they define family. Okay, family is a broad and exclusive inclusive term. It includes family members who do not live in the same household and relationship from bond of blood or blood or law, including common law. It includes relationship between parents and children including adoptive and foster children and with spouses, marital or common law, 
siblings, in-law, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, cousins, grandparents, grandchildren. Family can also include relationship not defined by blood or legal bonds. This may include chosen families, such as strong friendships and communities where unrelated persons provide care normally provided by nuclear family members. These relationships may be particularly important for Aboriginal people or people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and or transgender. So that's how Canadian Human Rights Commission define it. Oh, and wow. then later in the document, they go, employees have a duty to accommodate when an employee's need are based on any of the grounds discrimination the Canadian human rights law. In the case of caregiving, a duty to accommodate may arise when an employee's obligation to care for a family member, based on the previous definition, combined with the employer's existing rule of policy, make the employee unable to participate fully at work. So, in theory, you were you should be able to take a leave to offer care to a member of your chosen family. Okay, that's good to know. Right? And, um, you know, I think your employer can dispute it, but they have to prove that basically it would be a huge loss for the company if they offered you that, that leave. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. In the U.S., uh, some cities like L.A., New York, and Chicago also have uh, laws that people are able to take some time away from work to provide care for uh, loved ones, regardless of the blood or legal relationship. So they have the same place, but only in those few cities. It's, Mm -hmm. It's not as prevalent in the U.S. There's still a lot of work to be done, obviously. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but in Canada, uh, legal protections are limited for common law relationship. It's not the same as married, um, which is, in my mind, I had the idea of like, oh, common law and married is the same legally. Oh, yeah, no, I knew that, yeah. It's very different. Um, It also, it's uh, depending on the province, it's very different. I only knew that because it's different paperwork. That's why I assumed. Oh, because then okay, when okay. You, you do common law, you have to get an affidavit signed. Or sorry, you don't have to, but like our company required one. And then you, when you get married, you get a marriage license. Right. So in Ontario, common law status uh, entitles partners to spousal support, but not property rights. Mm, okay. Um, Quebec has the highest rate of common law unions in Canada at 40%, but the province does not grant the same rights at all so you don't have a spousal support and property rights in Quebec among other things that you that you would have if you were married okay um however BC is offering the same rights to common law as married partners interesting good to know because I and it's after only two years of living together yeah and it's um I think it can also be declared even without living together I think it's two years of relationship. You don't necessarily have to live together. Interesting. So in, when we did, when we common law in BC, we had to, um, yes, if we've been living at the same residence and he verified our driver's license to make sure that we had the same address. Right. I, I would have to look into it more, but I do. Honestly, and it's different right. province by province too, right? No, but in BC, I believe that there was a way to uh, prove oh. a relationship um, is legitimate without living together. Interesting. Which I find like, yeah, some, some, I, I know some married people who don't live together. Yeah, that's true. You know? Yeah. But I think when you get married, you don't have to prove that you live together from when I got exactly. married. Yeah, exactly. They didn't even check. They checked. They made, they, you, had to, you don't have to prove, but the, the questions are all like, are you guys related? Yeah. <laughs> Which is so, crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, um, to finish this off, I wanted to share some of my personal experiences with chosen yeah. families, because like I said, um, I mean this as a homage to the people who are important in my life. Uh-huh. Um, I think I have, I'm lucky. I have a lot of friends who I considered very, uh, close family. Mm-hmm. Um, however, they don't all know each other. So it's not, it's not a family unit per se. Yeah. Right. Um, there are relationships that withstand the test of time as distance, um, and for how much I moved around, that kind of was like important, right, for me. Wait, sorry right. to interrupt you while mm-hmm. you're about to go in your tribute. 
But if so chosen family doesn't mean that like this person is part of now you like they don't all have to know each other, right? Like I like we can have people that we no. consider our co- chosen family, but well, the the term has a very loose definition. In yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So when you said that, I was necessarily. Like, when you brought up that they don't know each other, I was like, wait, I don't think any of my chosen family really knows each other or considers each other family by any means. No, mm-hmm. but I think, you know, it's more um, when, for example, they do research and, 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 and stuff like that, they really look at units mm, of family true. members. Yeah, true. Sure. And I think a lot of what I've been going through is based mostly on that. Mm-hmm. Um, not solely. And I don't think one is more legitimate than the other. Exactly. Yeah. But I think it's a lot easier to have uh, access to a lot more support when you have that unit. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I also think it's important to maybe make those people aware that you view them that way. And to make sure that they agree also. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. If my friends are listening, we get a text today saying, hey, chosen family. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you can all pick a new family name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I do have people who have been in unmeasurable amount of support. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, navigating and understanding the gay culture for sure. Um, mm-hmm. And I won't be naming anyone because I don't think that's necessary. But you know who you are. um for me navigating mental health is some support that i had to go get outside of my family as well Mm -hmm. um uh simply adjusting to adulthood i I rely on the support of my friends a lot on that yeah and even you know learning how to groom and to shave and some other weird hygiene basis that you wouldn't suspect but I relied a lot on on some friends for that. Yeah. You know? um, there's a friend that I call whenever I'm sick or injured or have a weird rash that is kind of will help me navigate that. That's so uh, funny. <laughs> um, you know, I have friends who hosted me for two months during the pandemic in my hometown where my mom lives, but because it was better for my mental health to go live with them than to go live with my mom in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. They were more than happy to do that for me. Aw, that's right? so sweet. Um, I said, like, uh, like I said earlier, I have a friend who's very much of a, a parental figure and who took me under his wing and showed me a lot of love and, and patience and respects that, that I never got from my uh, father. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, more than that, and I think that was one of the most healing things that expressed so much delight into the person that I am and the person that I'm becoming. Mm-hmm. You know, Aww. someone who's watching me grow. Yeah. Um, and also, also like just offered a, a, a safe place and and and, and shelter at, at time for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even uh, during the pandemic, during lockdown, um we you were either not allowed to see anyone or if you were single and lived alone you were allowed to pick one person to see right mm-hmm. so i had a neighbor who was a friend who was that one person and we would do you know meals together every night really support each other through it and yeah and have all those stops and those one walks and stuff like that mm-hmm. um and then to some extent even uh ish who did our our branding mm-hmm. um who him I'm going to name because I, I want you all to go to his Instagram page at h.e.e.s.h. He's an amazing mm-hmm. artist. Amazing artist. Check his Instagram out. But who, you know, I think we framed it as return of a favor um, because I did him a favor in the past and we were all more comfortable framing it like that because he did an unmeasurable amount of work into it. Mm-hmm. But but really, he was doing it because he wanted to support me and, and by extension, you into our new endeavors and because he's super excited and, and supportive friend. Yeah, so supportive of us. Like, I love it. He's like, I feel like our biggest fan, <laughs> beside our own partners. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And then there's you, who, you know, I call anytime, every time, and who, you know, now more than ever, we talk all the time, either for the podcast, but then, you know, I think there was a short moment where I was like, are we going to get bored of talking to each other? And then in between episode, we call each other five times and talk on the phone for like two or three hours. You know, <laughs> I just texted Toma the other day. We were on the phone for two hours that morning. Then I listened to both our episodes. And then I still was like, oh, I'm going to call him. And I was like, no, I'll just text him. And I was like, how am I not sick of this person yet? <laughs> right. Um, but also all of that, that support that I received, uh, well, that I received currently and that I received in the past, have helped me become someone who can love and support uh, in return. Mm-hmm. And I think you and I had a, a talk recently about the concept of, of, of legacy and, and, and what you're leaving behind. Mm-hmm. And as someone who doesn't want children, um, I had those, those thoughts, right. But, but I still feel like now I'm able to, to give and, and to, to leave behind through my acts of giving right Mm -hmm. and there's there's friends i that i took under my wing now as like a younger sibling Mm -hmm. um and now i have a little baby that um she's she's naming me uncle tom too right Mm -hmm. yeah um or for stuff as simple as you know friends going on vacation i'll look after their house i'll look after their pets and stuff like that stuff that you know, um, one thing that's also always very important for me wherever I live is that I have space to host my friends who are out of town. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's primordial that I'm able to do that because I have so much family that's out of town now, like chosen family that's out of town because I've moved around so much. Yeah. Which was weird because it makes it really hard to choose where to live. Because mm-hmm. I'm never fully home. There's always a part of me that's somewhere else, right? Yeah. But that's what um, I love about I mean, it. Because you know you have a home in so many different places. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's a very hard life. But I just <laughs> Like, oh, I don't know where to live because I have too many friends all over the world. I know. <laughs> you know, but I try to take seriously uh, that sense of responsibility towards those people and and to make myself available for 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 them, mm-hmm. right? Um, but yeah, relationships can evolve and change, and and there are some people that you know I lost uh, along the way, and some people that I gain uh, loss. I didn't lose, I, like I didn't die you or anything. But like connections, with, connections you know? with yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But um, I think part of my resolutions for for this year are very in tight with that. You know, I want to be much more intentional in my, um, my, my interaction with my chosen family. And I Mm -hmm. think I want to be much more outspoken about my care and love, uh, to them and, Mm -hmm. and, and, and how I view them and how I value them in that sense. And really more, I'm more committed to those people also. Mm -hmm. I totally Uh, agree. I feel like, as I get older, I'm realizing like how valuable like time with people you love and care about are is and how like, you know, like it's so easy to be like to a friend, like, oh, let's go grab a drink, you know, but I'm like, no, let's go like talk. Let's get deep. You yeah. Know? And I really like those yeah. interactions with friends. I think the more and more like there's there used to just be like a handful of people I would call, but I think more and more, like I call so many people all the time now. There's so many phone catch-ups I need to do all the time and I love it. Um, You know, um, obviously there are some friends that I don't call all the time and we're more texters or we're more like I have those friends that I don't talk to for years sometimes. And then you Mm -hmm. see them and you just pick up where you left off. Oh yeah, 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 Mm -hmm. same. And those friendships I'm also so grateful for. I also have friends who I don't have any meaningful interactions with them um, other than like once every two months when we catch each other. Mm-hmm. But that on the daily, 
we're selling communication through memes and through stupid jokes. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Commenting <laughs> on each other's photos, like you go. Girl. Yeah. And exactly. It's like, and it's like I haven't seen this person in seven years, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's uh, that's what I had for you today. Okay. Um. You know what I keep thinking of? I don't know if you so, did this, but when I was in high school, I think high, yeah, or middle school even when Facebook first came out. Um, mm -hmm. did you like make all of your friends at the time your siblings? No, that's weird. <laughs> that's so funny because we did that. You Literally, did that? like really? I have like I, I I think after like as the years went on, I like, you know, took all of them, a lot of them off, but there's still a couple of my friends that are still my sister relation on my Ooh. Facebook that are really like sisters to me in real life. You know what? I think my first reflex was like, that's weird because I think it would have been weird if I had done that because I definitely did not have those kind of friendships in high school. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny. I have but, my um, two besties from high school still and I'm pretty sure we have some sort of relationship on Facebook. But that's that's really cute. And I think that's that's exactly what this is, right? Mm -hmm. That's the people you chose to help you navigate high school and all these things and it was chosen family. Mm -hmm. and um, And if it's the two people I'm thinking of, they were at your wedding and I met exactly, them. They're still very yeah. much part of your life. Yeah, they know who they are. Hashtag they know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Were you guys the cool kids or were you guys like the losers? Uh, I'm like, I feel like I would like to. It's so funny because we all were so different too. Um, but mm. no, we were definitely the, I think we were like the losers, but we hung out with the cool kids sometimes. We were our own. Oh, yeah. On our own. You tolerated. You guys were exactly. tolerated. Yeah. And we ah. like, we were like, we felt like, it's so funny because like, I don't even think we hung out the last couple of years of high school. Um, in school. Mm. We would just hung out outside of school. Um, cause we oh, yeah. Had our own cliques and school. It's so weird to think about. Uh, um, but they were the OGs. Oh, yeah. I was a theater kid. <laughs> Of course you were. I'm not surprised. Yeah, it didn't pan out for me. It didn't work out like that for me. But, <laughs> um, which I think theater kids live on the line between cool kids and losers. Like, no? Okay, well. Uh, moving on. <laughs> I think, I think we, uh, cool. we all know where theater <laughs> kids are. <laughs> all right. Well, Sonia uh again happy new years and i'm very happy to uh to still uh you know um have so Talk much to you this year yeah, i don't know where i'm going with this you know what i'm happy to have uh to have started this endeavor with you and to to see that grow in the new year yeah i feel like you started uh this episode off by saying this is something different and then you're like wait we've only done like six episodes yeah. but you know what i like how we started the new year on such a wholesome note um kind of like a personal shout out to all our family chosen family yeah. to support us you know and make us who we are today yeah exactly mm -hmm. oh this is so um heartfelt and I, I if you're watching the video you can probably see Soma was cheering up oh my god for <laughs> part of this I can't I just can't talk about people who I care for without tearing up yeah <sighs> so cute we love it well we hope you all have an amazing year to come yeah and take um, care of yours and 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 yourself yeah thank you for listening bye see you next week Tell Me Like I'm Stupid is created and produced by us, Sonia and Toma. You can follow us on Instagram at Tell Me Like I'm Stupid. If you'd like to support us, please subscribe and review on your favorite podcast streaming platform. Our cover art was created by Ish. Find him on Instagram at h.e.e.s.h. Thank you for listening.